All right. Today we're talking with uh, emergency physician, author, simulation educator, and coach, Dr. Andrea Austin. Andrea, you've had a really interesting uh, life experiences, uh, heavily involved with the military and emergency uh, medicine. So I'd like for you to take us back and tell us about your medical background and what you've done over the years. I graduated medical school in 2011, and there's a program called the Health Professions Scholarship Program for people that go to a civilian medical school. You actually join the military, become an officer, you're on reserve duty throughout medical school. And then after that, you need to do residency. And I was selected for residency at Naval Medical Center San Diego. So I started residency there, graduated in 2015, and then stayed on as faculty. And about a year later, deployed to Iraq with a special purpose Marine Air Ground Task Force uh, to Al-Assad. Saw quite a bit of trauma there, came back and then stayed as faculty and then moved up to the Navy Trauma Training Center, which is where the Navy Uh, trains people before they deploy. So I was able to use that experience in Iraq, come back and pay it forward, training mainly small surgical teams that were heading out. Mm -hmm. Were you actually a Navy, a Naval medical doctor? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Um, Yeah. What what a phenomenal experience, phenomenal program. So tell us, uh, Tell us a little bit about, I, I actually have not heard of the Navy Trauma Training Center until I was reading your bio. Um, how long has that been around? Navy Trauma Training Center was founded around 2001. It was already in the works before 9-11 happened. And then once 9-11 happened, obviously the military knew that um, they were going to rapidly need to increase trauma proficiency for healthcare professionals. And, and I know you have a lot of veterans listening, but I, th- I do think it's worth discussing a little bit about the military healthcare system. And there's some issues happening now that are very relevant to everyone listening. So th- ironically, <laughs> and you can't make this up, uh, there really aren't many trauma centers that are military hospitals, even though really a large portion of the expectation for military physicians and surgeons is to be able to take care of trauma. So in the United States, I believe uh, Brooke Army Medical Center, BMC in in Texas, I believe is the only military level one trauma center. So um, recognizing that the military has formed partnerships with trauma centers and The Army has a partnership with Ryder in Miami. Um, We also have a partnership, the Air Force, with shock trauma in Baltimore. And then the Navy is now formally known as L.A. County, uh, name switched to L.A. General since 2001. And I actually know the emergency physician uh, that was responsible for standing up that partnership that has endured um, for, for a long time now. Yeah, I had heard uh, years ago, uh, Navy corpsmen and uh, Army medics would go do a tour in ER rooms around the country. It was, but it was more of a random thing. It wasn't a formalized location like that. So, um, and really, if you think about it, like the original purpose of military medicine was trauma on the battlefield. I mean, that that was where it all originally started from. But, you know, that's where the need was. Um, so it, it's an interesting point that we've almost gotten completely away from that in peacetime practice. Um, and obviously the last 20, 20 years, Afghanistan, Iraq and everything else, uh, our military medicine has been quite busy with the trauma. Absolutely. And despite the challenges has made phenomenal advances. I mean, it's, it's hard for some of us that have been in the military to believe this, but you know, at the beginning of OEF and OIF, um, tourniquets weren't used. It it was still thought that tourniquets caused more damage than good. Clearly, we all know that tourniquets are very, very important with um, non, you know, extremity trauma. Um, So that was a huge advancement. Um, Keeping people warm. I mean, you know, I'm looking to my left, there's a wonderful book called Out of the Crucible that talks about the advances in military medicine. And, you know, initially, 
at the beginning of Afghanistan, keeping people warm was using body bags. Um, we learned, <laughs> you know, obviously that was not an ideal way to put living people in, but we did what we needed to do. And we put people in body bags to keep them warm. Um, so the trauma advances happened despite us not having tons of trauma exposure. Uh, the military does, I think, do a good job of what's called just in time training. And that was the model at Navy trauma training center to bring people in right before they're heading out the door and rapidly increase their trauma expertise through clinical exposure. And then the other side of my job was simulation based and the military, I think is, you know, really quite adept and advanced at medical simulations and uses a lot of simulators that, you know, quite frankly, I, I don't have access to in the civilian places I work now. Yeah. All right. Quick break. We'll be right back. We're back talking with uh, Dr. Andrea Austin. So talk to us about simulation in the, in the medical field. Yeah. So medical simulation started in, I would say the modern era in like the 1960s. And I, I believe you mentioned um, that you're a pilot. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, aviation has a great history with simulation. Yeah. And if you're stepping onto a plane, you look up at the pilot, you, you know that they've spent significant amounts of time in a simulator. And right. I would say for medical students now, you know, I asked, I just uh, had intern orientation. I asked the medical students to raise their hand if they're, if they use simulators at their medical school and a hundred percent raise their hands, which probably even five years ago, maybe that was 75% and 10 years ago, maybe only half of them were using simulators. Mm -hmm. So there's different types. Um, probably the easiest to understand is a simulator that looks like a patient. And so it's kind of like a, ro a robot. It has a computer on the inside and yeah. the most advanced ones simulate breathing. They can talk, um, heart sounds, pulses, sweat, cry, bleed. Mm -hmm. And the ones I used at Navy Trauma Training Center by a company called Operative Experiences, which is also located in San Diego where I am, uh, are called cut suits. And they actually allowed the surgeons to practice operations. And you could put blood packs inside the abdomen. And so when you would cut in, there would actually be bleeding and they could remove a spleen or splice parts of the bowel back together. And I mean, I have videos of those simulations and you have to look really carefully to see that it's a simulator. And that training... You know, when I think back to when, you know, the first patient I had in Iraq that had amputations, I mean, we don't see that very often, mm -hmm. um, thankfully, in, you know, a civilian uh, hospital. So the first time I saw that, I was ready to go. And I didn't hesitate at all because I had had such realistic simulations before I left. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, a lot of people may not realize this, but in the in the airline world, the first time the pilot ever flies the actual airplane is when there's paying customers on board. All the training, all the training up to that point has been done in a simulator. They're signed off, considered qualified in that aircraft. And then the very first time they actually fly the airplane is a regular revenue flight. <laughs> wow. I mean, that's just such a huge testament to the fidelity, the realism mm -hmm. of the simulations. Yeah. You just add, you know, basically all you add is the reality, but you know, the checklists and processes and procedures all, all remain the same from the simulator for the most part. And then you just have to add, add a dose of reality to it and you're doing the same thing. So, um, that's how, that's how good simulators are today. So, um, at the Navy trauma training center, is there is it just a training center or do they actually have regular emergency room patients coming in from LA as part of integrated as part of the, the overall process? So Navy trauma training center is embedded on the LA general campus. And for anybody listening uh, that watched the very old soap opera general hospital, or you can Google it, yeah. the old hospital, the iconic old hospital on that campus is where, which was actually 
the old hospital, Navy Trauma Training Center is located in there. And so there's several offices. And then this the simulation bay, which is made to look like a deployed trauma room, was the old LA General waiting room. So that's where Navy Trauma Training Center is. And then you walk out the courtyard and then you're into the new hospital. So it was very common for the corpsmen and nurses and physicians that were coming through as we'd spend the morning in the classroom, the afternoon in the simulation lab, and then we'd walk over together um, because I was fully credentialed and working shifts at LA General. They would work um, with me. I would supervise them in the emergency department at LA General. So we went from talking about gunshot wounds to simulating gunshot wounds to taking care of a patient with a gunshot wound all within, you know, a 12 to 16 hour span. Yeah. Now, ultimately you got in, you, you wrote a book and you got into coaching, uh, probably triggered or based a lot, a lot on you know, burnout that you had experienced in the, in the medical field. You, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on that for us? Yeah. You know, when I think back to that period of time, and I think, you know, a lot of veterans can relate to this is I'm incredibly proud of my service. You know, I always tell people that being a veteran may be a better person, a better citizen, a better doctor. But what I didn't understand is the amount of stress that was happening. And I was in a pretty revved up state all the time um, from deployment to coming home to moving to Los Angeles. And when you're the physician at Navy Trauma Training Center, whether you're one of the surgeons or the emergency physician, all you do is trauma. And, you know, I, I saw a lot of traumatizing things deployed. I saw a lot of traumatizing things um, at LA General. Yeah. And I didn't really have a roadmap on how to process that. And then, you know, I left the military in 2020 and the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And that was traumatizing on a, a, like a whole different level. You know, the first few months, we didn't really know what COVID, well, nobody knew what COVID was or how it worked. And, you know, I felt like being in a room with a COVID patient initially was like trying to defuse a bomb. You, like you're in this dangerous environment with somebody that's breathing and coughing yeah. And you know, it could be harmful to you or harmful to your loved one. You know, I could bring it home to my husband and make him sick. Right. Um, and so I was in this revved up stressed state for years and I just ran out of gas by 2021 is like the easiest way to put it. Um, my n nervous system, my body was just really tired. And when that happens, at this point, I'm out of the military. I wasn't sure if it was a personal failing, if there was something wrong with me, or maybe I wasn't a good fit for emergency medicine anymore. So I just took some time off, um, which is honestly, I, I laugh because when you talk to most veterans, a lot of people do take time off. Um, you know, if they are financially able to, um, they take, you know, a, a three month, six month pause before jumping into their next job. And I just, I hadn't done that. I went from Navy trauma training center to working during the pandemic. And, you know, I'm a physician. I talk to patients all the time that, you know, if you won't make the pause, your body will eventually force you to make the pause. And, you know, I was still able to function, but I could see the writing on the wall that if I didn't take this pause, that, um, I was running the risk of making myself, um, I wasn't physically ill at that point, but I felt like if I didn't stop, I could get there. So I spent those three months reading every book, paper in the medical literature about physicians and burnout podcast and talking to people, going to therapy, getting a coach. And I ended up deciding that I still wanted to be a physician. And honestly, the first place I started working at, well, there were two, 
I took a simulation position at Navy or sorry, Naval Postgraduate School where I'm the simulation uh, director for an online program teaching people in the military how to be simulation educators. Mm -hmm. So that was great. You know, the joke is I lasted nine months and I was uh, back working for the government. Mm -hmm. And then I took a contract position. I know this podcast is about entrepreneurship. I became an independent contractor working out at 29 Palms, which I know there's a few people that have been out to 29 Palms. So I worked in the ER there uh, for about about a year uh, before I got um, a different position being the simulation director closer to my home. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, that's one message I would say to veterans. Um, You know, sometimes you do need some distance from your military service, but there are really great opportunities uh, potentially for contractors if you don't want to be a GS employee, uh, if you want to keep some distance there. Um, and, and so I'm an independent contractor that to this day still works with the government. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Um, talk a little bit about actually like simulation education. Like what, what, what role is that? What, what do you do? What do you spend most of your time doing with that? Yeah. So there's two main ways that I, I'm involved in simulation. One is still with the military. And um, so so anybody who wants to learn like what I do can take this one year program. And while they're in the military, it's free. And that's with the Naval Postgraduate School. So if you Google Naval Postgraduate School and simulation, our program will come up. And then the other thing I do is I'm a simulation lab director. So for the most part, if you have a residency program or medical school, Generally, you have a lab or a building, a place where a lot of the simulation equipment is housed. And I direct our simulation center operations, and I still do a lot of the direct education. So last week was the arrival of all the new interns, and they're I mean, they're, they're physicians, they've graduated medical school, but there's still a lot they need to learn. So mm-hmm. we used our our mannequin and put them through some cases involving things that are very common that they'll see chest pain, shortness of breath, um, and get to, you know, really have them practice on a simulator before they're seeing actual patients. Um, there's certain procedures that are more high risk. So something called putting a central line in or intubating, putting a breathing tube in, And the simulators for that are very good. And there is, in my mind, absolutely no reason that a patient in the United States should ever have a new doctor uh, doing that procedure on them without being uh, first in the simulation lab and getting signed off that they're competent to be able to do that procedure. And beyond the patient safety, which honestly is, you know, a big motivator for why I do simulation the other side is the physician and healthcare worker well-being because you know I've been involved in medical errors or cases that went suboptimally and that creates a lot of stress and emotional toll on our healthcare professionals so honestly at this point one of the biggest reasons I do simulation is because I'm so passionate about the well-being of our healthcare professionals. And, you know, we have not uh, rebounded since the pandemic, you know, the emergency departments I still work in are severely understaffed. That includes at the Naval hospital, there, there, any given day, several pods, or, you know, the term is what we use pods, uh, collections of beds are not opened because they can't hire enough nurses. The other place I work, they can't keep nurses. So it used to be when I started in emergency medicine, that a nurse had to have two years experience before they started working in the emergency department, because we recognize it to be a high risk environment. Things move fast. People are undifferentiated, meaning we don't know what's wrong with them when they come through the door. And now we have new nurses all the time. (laughs) And, you know, we've, something's got to give. And I think part of making things better is simulation. If we're going to have 
this massive disruption in the workforce and have so many new nurses. Um, and I call out nurses a little bit because the regulations around their training is not quite as rigorous. And, you know, there was a scandal a few, few years ago about a place that was issuing nursing degrees with very little, um, very little training. Um, a lot of their training is moved online. And so we've got new nurses coming out that often do not have the same level of clinical exposure before they graduate mm -hmm. entering dangerous work environments. Honestly, the ER is a dangerous place for somebody that is not very well-trained and experienced. It's not the place you want to be learning to hang antibiotics and, you know, all the things that's not the place to learn to ri ride the horse. <laughs> right. Wow. No kidding. Um, can you talk about your coaching program? Yeah, absolutely. So this journey I've been on for the last, you know, honestly, five years of self-discovery going through coaching and then getting my coaching certification, you know, I started off embarrassingly, I would say in this learned helplessness mindset that, you know, the system is failing. It's not fair. There's nothing I can do. Healthcare is too big of an entity to make any significant change. And what I discovered in the coaching process is that, you know, we do have agency. We do have choice on where we work and there's certain things in our control to make those working environments better. So my ideal people that I like to coach are healthcare professionals. Um, I have a nurse that I'm coaching right now. I love working with nurses. Um, obviously I love working with physicians as well but anybody with a healthcare background and that they, if they feel stuck, if they want personal change in their own life, maybe they want to be more effective making change in their healthcare organization. And I would also say that, you know, I love working with people in transition, um, military veterans. I, it's a small niche, but the um, veterans that are with a healthcare background, you know, I would love to be able to guide somebody through the process and not maybe land as, as uh, well, don't land on your face at all. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I, I think effectively I landed on my face a little bit when I came out, you know, I, I dusted the dust off and I'm doing okay, doing great now. Yeah. Uh, but I would love to work with people and, and help them um, really thrive because when you're in the military, you know, many people do thrive and have great careers, but what is different when you're in the military is there's only so much choice that you have. And when you leave, you have endless choices and to learn to have that new mindset that you are in charge, you are in the driver's seat for a lot of people may take some coaching. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's interested in uh, contacting you about possibly being their coach, how do they do that? Just go to my website, which is andreaaustinmd.com. I have a page with coaching. You can take a look and then there's a schedule, a call button. Awesome. And let's talk about your book. <laughs> yes. Yes. So exciting. I just sent the, the final draft to my editor. So in the very last stages, it's called Revitalize, a guidebook to rediscovering your heart line while doctoring. And it's essentially you know, well, it's my story. It's my memoir. I, I start off with, um, my childhood and why I became a doctor. And then I talk about my time in the military, the pandemic. And then the last third of the book is all the things that I learned to rebuild myself through therapy and coaching, meditation, all the different practices that can help us be well. And I have paint, painted a somewhat dark uh, picture for healthcare right now. At the same time, I really do think people can thrive and we can make a difference. And, and everybody has a, a gift. Anybody that's a healthcare professional has a gift that they can give the system. And the more of us that are showing up, um, our authentic selves um, and using our, our gifts, we can make a difference. The system is actually made of people. It's one of my favorite expressions from a coach um, that I've worked with, Sheree Johnson. <laughs> the system is actually made of us and we need to remind ourselves of that. That's awesome. Um, 
So I do want to give you the last word. We're close to the end of our time um, in context of transition and uh, getting out and seeing those other opportunities that are essentially unlimited, uh, especially on the, on the entrepreneur side of things. Uh, what kind of advice comes to mind for somebody transitioning out on the way out, or maybe they, they've been out for a little while, but don't really like where they landed. Listen to yourself would be the first thing that I would say is, you know, we, if you're in the, if you're a veteran, you're, you're good at listening um, and being told what to do. And you're able to tolerate a lot more than the, the average employee. So a lot of times you're able to, you know, suck it up and get through things, but you don't need to do that anymore. And so listen to that internal voice and start writing things down, start leaving yourself voice memos. If you don't like to write things down and start talking to people, you know, join, join a new group, join a networking group, um, have that diversity of thought because you can't start something or do something different if you don't have some exposure to what it would look like. And you don't have to do it alone. You can, you know, hire people to help you. You know, someone helped me make my website. I have somebody that helps me edit my podcast. And, you know, it takes takes a team, takes a village. You know, I hired a um, editor to help me get my book across the, the hurdle, the finish line. So, I think maybe that's the other thing is the entrepreneur, you know, a lot of times it, it's you, but honestly, what you're not seeing is there's a huge team of people behind me and certainly been a whole lot of people that have mentored and sponsored and, you know, people that I bumped into at conferences or had zoom calls with that have helped me get a little bit further down the road. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, doing great things. Um, good luck with your book when it comes out and, uh, Hope to see you, you know, good luck with your future success with your coaching program and everything else. And uh, thanks for being here and sharing your personal story. Thank you. It's been an absolute honor to be on your podcast. Awesome. All right. Thanks. And uh, these two veterans are Oscar Mike.